Hey everyone, my name is Ben Farley. I'm the lead minister here at Redbrush Christian Church. First of all, I want to thank you so much for streaming our services online. So as we worship together, as we listen to the word taught together, our prayer is that this blesses you and draws you into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. However, this resource is simply that. It is in no way meant to replace you belonging to a local group of believers. And so it's our prayer that you would be a part of a local church. And if you're in our area, we would love for you to check out what God is doing here at Redbreast Christian Church. Good morning, everybody. Let's stand as we sing. I was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that kind of weight? It was not so.
devotional reading through everyone's favorite devotional devotional book, uh, Leviticus. And uh, I was looking at just some of the offerings that we were, that people were required to give. Of the five offerings, uh, four of them involved blood. I don't, I don't do blood very well. Um, my wife gives me a hard time about that often, but if it's, if it's blood, that's her area. Uh, I don't do that. I, I struggle. And it just struck me the, the seriousness of sin, uh, how seriously God takes our sin. Uh, if you go back to when sin first entered into the world, uh, obviously we know about the separation that that caused humans to have from God. But I think sometimes what we forget is in that moment, uh, when Adam and Eve realized their condition, they realized their nakedness, God killed an innocent animal to create clothing for them. Going back to Leviticus all throughout, we see the death of innocent animals uh, to make up for our mistakes. Uh, the Passover lamb was an innocent, unblemished animal that was slain for our mistakes. And yet we come to this time every week uh, to pause and to remember the sacrifice of an unblemished person blood that was shed, innocent blood that was shed on our behalf. Peter writes it this way in 1 Peter 3, for Christ also suffered for sins once for all, 
the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirits. It is that innocent death that we come to celebrate each and every week. The blood of the lamb that was slain to atone for our mistakes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the innocent blood that was shed, uh, that you willingly gave up your life, uh, the life of your son to, to reconcile us back to you. God, there was nothing that we could do. Uh, there was no amount of works that we could accomplish, no amount of things that we could give up. Um, and you knew that. So you came as the innocent sacrifice. We thank you for that now uh, and each and every day of our lives. We pray this in the name of your innocent Holy Son, Jesus. Amen.
good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you into Red Brush Christian Church this morning. Uh, we are wrapping up a series uh, that we've called The Good Life. And starting next week, let me give you a little preview as to where we're going to go. Uh, next week, we are opening up uh, probably the most requested book for me to preach on. We're going to open up the book of Revelation. So we're going to look through the first three chapters of Revelation. And uh, I think what you'll find as we look at the letter to the seven churches is that it may not be what you think it is. It may not be what you've seen on TV that it is. And so we want to look at the book of Revelation accurately, biblically, and in context. It's one of my favorite things to kind of come back to is the context around a particular uh, book, a particular verse. And so this is what we're going to do through the first three chapters of Revelation starting next week. However, in our current series, we have been looking at not the second most requested topic, maybe the last requested topic, the topic of stewardship. Everyone's favorite topic. But what we found through this series is that when people think of the biblical idea of stewardship, their minds often go to money. And certainly we've laid out through this series that yes, that is a piece of it, but biblical stewardship is so much more than that. We are, as believers in Christ, told that we are stewarding not just one element of our lives, but everything. Everything that we have has been given to us by a good and gracious father. And so money is a piece of that. In fact, it's a good barometer of where our heart's at, but it's not the entire picture as it pertains to stewardship. And so the, the theme verse that we've had throughout this series is 1 Peter 4, verse 10. It says, each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So what I hope you've seen throughout this series is that stewardship is what you do with what you've been given. Not just one area, but with your whole lives. Stewardship is what you do with what you've been given. And so to boil it down to one area is to vastly underestimate the call of God to believers. And so we start by saying this, we exist to build the kingdom for the glory of God. And this is why stewardship is such an important aspect of a believer's life. So in week one throughout this series, we looked at the idea of relationships. And if you remember that, se that sermon, we ended with something that probably made most of you somewhat uncomfortable. I would just say, hey, as, as you leave today, go out in the Family Life Center, go introduce yourself to somebody that you don't know. Man, it, it was so awesome to hear the stories of, of people telling me, hey, I went out and I met seven people that I didn't know. That's a big deal. But I, I hope you understand that's not just something that happens at the end of one sermon. That's, that's how we're to live our lives. As believers, as it pertains to relationships, what you'll find is that you will find a lot of joy when becoming uncomfortable is a part of your regular routine. You'll find that there are blessings in there that you didn't realize were there if you just step out of your comfort zone. So relationships is a key area that we steward. Week two, we looked at money and possessions, and this is what everyone expects when you talk about stewardship, but we said everything that you have is God's anyways. That he owns it all. And our response with that is to build the kingdom with what he's given us. And so we're generous because he's been generous to us. Last week we talked about this idea of our gifts and abilities. And here's what you need to understand. This means you. When we talk about these things like gifts and abilities, oftentimes we think that that is, that is relegated to someone else. As a believer in Christ, the promise that has been given to you is that you have gifts and abilities to share with the body of believers, to build up the kingdom, to make much of the name of Jesus Christ. You have been given those for the glory of God, not to glorify ourselves. As we end this series this morning, we're, we're going to go a, a place that I think you may be uncomfortable going. 
Uh, we're going to talk about stewardship of your thoughts. This is a scary thing. There is something about this idea, even, even for the youngest among us, that when we think about our thoughts that we have and, and the idea that, that maybe someone else has some insight into our thoughts, it is terrifying because you know what goes through your mind. I know what goes through my mind. It's a scary place to be at times. I had a conversation with my youngest daughter, Bennett, a couple weeks ago. We were driving just her and I in the vehicle. And she kind of asked me a random question. She said, Dad, if I talk really quietly, can Jesus still hear me? I said, well, yeah, babe. He, he can hear you no matter how loudly or quietly you talk. And, and in fact, he actually knows what you think. And there was silence in the car. And as to get out in front of any bad thoughts that she may have, she says, I, I just thought about how much I love my family. Like, I want God to know I'm thinking good thoughts. Now, there's something about our thoughts being played out for all to see that it's scary to us. And it speaks to a couple of realities. A couple of things that, that my thoughts and, and your thoughts should get us to recognize. The first thing is this. When I think about some of the thoughts that run through my mind, I recognize that this idea of the depravity of man is absolutely true. I know some of the thoughts I have. You know some of the thoughts that you have. And when I think through those and play those back, I recognize that when Christ has told us there is no one good, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, I see that that includes me. Our, our thoughts are an indication of this biblical truth. And as a result of that, man, I am thankful for the grace of Christ. That this is where this should take us. When I know what runs through my head and you know what runs through your head, I recognize that if I'm trying to save myself, I, I should know just from my thoughts alone that I'm incapable of saving myself. And it should bring me to a place of absolute surrender because I recognize that goodness is not naturally found in me, but thank the Lord it is found in him. So I recognize the depravity of man. I recognize the grace of God through his son, Jesus Christ, to take my sin and the penalty of it from me. And the last thing is this. Even though... I hope as a believer you can look back and say, I'm not who I used to be. That the thoughts that I have aren't what they used to be. I still recognize that from time to time my flesh plays out in my mind. That those thoughts are still there. And it leads me to this place of thankfulness and dependence on the Holy Spirit's work of sanctification. The fact that I am continually being made new. That, that yes, I'm not who I was 10 years ago, but thank goodness 10 years from now, I'm not gonna be who I am today. It should lead us to recognize these three realities. And praise God all the more for it. So as we end this series, we're gonna look at three separate texts, all written by the Apostle Paul, that speak to this reality of the mind. And now as believers, where we go from here. So we're going to open up into Romans 12. We're going to work through just the first two verses in there, and then we'll turn to the next text. But in the lead up to chapter 12 of Romans, what Paul has done is he's really established the framework of the gospel. Here, here's who you are Here's who Christ is. Here's what he's done for you so that you are solid on what Jesus has done and what it means for you. So he starts off by really laying out the problem that you and I have. He lays out this idea that we just established. There is no one good. We're not comparing ourselves to each other. We're comparing ourselves to a holy, righteous, perfect God. And when you establish that as the measuring stick, you start to see really quickly, I'm in trouble. So he starts there and he says, here's the problem for all of humanity. You're a sinner. And as a result, 
the wrath of God is coming. That, that it's being poured out in part now, but there's a day coming when it will be fully poured out. And as a result, he reminds believers that as it pertains to the law, you need to understand that, that just, just obedience to the law itself, just doing these religious things isn't enough to save you. Because we've already established that, that you're not perfect, that you're sinful. And so trying to do the law perfectly is going to result in failure in you and I. And so the law is not meant to be this life preserver from sin. It's meant to be a mirror that you see, wow, I really don't measure up. I really don't have what it takes to fulfill this perfectly. And as a result, it leads us to the grace that is found in Jesus Christ to save I continually come back to this because I don't think we ever I don't think we ever move beyond this that the, the gospel of Jesus Christ has to remain the center of everything that we do everything that we preach because everything flows out of it you need to understand that as a believer the righteousness that you have is not your own that it's Jesus Christ's righteousness that has been given to you so when God looks at you and I, if we've put our faith in him, he sees the perfection of his son, not that we're perfect, but that he is. And when he looks at his son, he's poured out his wrath that was due for my sin on him. Like this is the great exchange that Paul lays out all throughout Romans. And so our sin and the resulting wrath has been placed fully on him. But now we've been left to fend for ourselves, right? <laughs> Absolutely not. And Paul says, now you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit that is making you new, that is sanctifying you and you're becoming more and more like Christ. It's given you the power to live this Christian life and it binds us together with other believers. And as a result, there is a coming glory that awaits believers regardless of what this life holds now. So the question is, what do we do as a result? Where do we go from here? Because grace of this magnitude, it deserves a response. If I've, I've been given this gift, I, I, I've got Christ's righteousness given to me now, what, what do I do in response to this? And again, the great news is that you've not been left to figure this out on your own. We've been given the spirit that gives us the power to live this Christian life and validates the transformation power of Jesus. So the first thing that Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse one is this. Therefore, knowing all of the rest of that is true, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. What Paul is expressing is that as a result of what Christ has done for us, the call for all believers is to surrender to him. Not just, not just the physical, but your whole self. You've got to understand that the gospel means that you and I are not segmented people. And what I mean by that is this. We are not people who say, Jesus, you can have this area, you can have this area, but I'm gonna hold on to this. He's either Lord of all or he's not. And the work of the Holy Spirit is that we continually give more and more of ourselves to him and be made more and more into his likeness as we live this life. And so if you're sitting here thinking, I'm going to keep this area to myself, the reality is, is he's come for all of you. Every part of you. So Paul says in verse 2, as a result of that, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
I, I want you to understand what Paul is doing here. He is dismantling a couple of ideas as to why Jesus came. And both of these are just as prevalent and just as false today as they were then. The first idea is this, and, and the reality is, as many of us think this way, that Jesus has saved us, but hasn't called us to a new way of living. It's this idea of hyper grace, and, and Paul addresses this in other letters. It's like, well, Jesus saved me, so now I can just do whatever I want. Right, 35, 40 years ago, I was baptized, and now I've just lived however I want since then. It doesn't matter, Christ has saved me. Paul says, no. No, this isn't the mark of a believer. The mark of a believer is justification by him and now sanctification by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, you cannot be the same now as you were then because the Holy Spirit is too powerful to allow that to happen. And the second idea is this, that Jesus has simply come to institute behavior modification. That if you'll just, at least on the outside, clean yourself up a little bit. Like maybe, maybe don't say as many cuss words. Maybe, maybe just, just clean up the outward appearance. That's just as false as the other idea. In fact, this is, this is the, the chastisement of Jesus to the Pharisees. Your whitewashed tombs, you look good on the outside, but yet the innermost parts of you are just as corrupt as they were before. And both of these are dangerously false. So I want to give you a couple big theological words here, and then we'll unpack those. You do not have justification by Jesus without sanctification of the Holy Spirit. And what we mean by that is this. You do not have someone that is saved by the grace of Jesus Christ and over the course of their life does not become conformed more and more into his image. It just doesn't happen. You don't have one without the other. And so what Paul is referring to when he says, be transformed, he's saying you're becoming a new creation. And the way that you're becoming a new creation is, is first by the justification of Jesus Christ and now by the renewing of your mind. So we're going to take that and we're going to jump to the next letter of Paul, Colossians. We're going to jump to Colossians chapter 3. Because it's in his letter to the church at Colossae that, that Paul begins to really show us practically how this plays out in a believer's life. So he says this in chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. He says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God when Christ who is your life appears then you also will appear with him in glory so surely Paul is saying now that that as you live this Christian life just keep your head in the clouds pay no attention to any earthly things that are in this life no He's not asking you to, to hide yourself away. He's not asking you to just be ignorant of all the things of the world. But what he is saying is that our focus is not on these temporary things, but that our focus is on the things that will last from this life to the next. And he gives us the markers of each of these people. He says there are two groups of people that they're, are those whose minds have not been transformed and there are those whose minds are being transformed. So he says in verse five, here are some of the practical things that happen. He says, put to death, therefore whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. What's the common denominator of all of these? They originate in the mind. 
This is what Paul is saying, that you're, you're living a certain way, but it's, it's not just starting as the outward appearance. All of these things are beginning in your mind. And, and you know, practically speaking, this is where sin originates from. Generally, when you sin, it's because you've had the thoughts first. And so Paul says, we're not just trying to, to clean up our behavior. We're... We're transforming the mind. That the Holy Spirit is transforming us to, to not just not doing certain things, but to totally think differently. So I worded something on purpose a moment ago. That as Paul lays out these two groups of people, there is the person whose mind has not been transformed, and there is the person whose mind is being transformed. Because the reality is, is however long, however mature of a believer you are, you'll still find that these thoughts of your flesh still, they still come. What I don't want you to, to feel is that if your flesh still rears its ugly heads, head at times that no one else can understand, right? We still have an element of flesh this side of eternity that, that rears its ugly head. And the point of all that is when we see that, we ask, the Lord, God, can continue to refine me. So he says, put these things to death. This isn't a one-time thing. You and I both know this is a repeating thing. This is something in me that I feel like is far too necessary than it should be at this point in my life. But it is a, it is a continual putting to death the things of the earthly nature. So if you still see these things popping up, you're in, you're in good company. But it should cause us all the more to seek to die to ourselves and ask the Holy Spirit to continue to transform us. And so Paul says that there is a difference in the person who hasn't been transformed and the person who is being transformed. He says, you used to walk in these ways, verse seven, in the life you once lived. But now, you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Here's the thing that you see in Jesus' ministry that he continually comes back to as well. There's, there's not just a hyper fixation on the outward appearance. But there is a, a real, there is a real focus on the heart. And so this is what Paul is doing following Jesus' example. He says, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So again, he's, he's tackling this nature of the Pharisees and saying, if you think it is just this behavior modification, like just cleaning yourself up to look better amongst each other, you're, you're missing the point. He says, anybody can clean up the outside and pretend for a moment. But what we're seeking is actual heart change. What we're seeking is the actual renewal of our mind. I'm not just trying to think better thoughts and, and do better things. I'm living in the freedom that comes from Jesus Christ and relying on what he's promised that the Holy Spirit will make me new. Because I think so many of us come, we come from this mindset of, gosh, if I'm going to if I'm gonna get any closer to Christ or if I'm, gonna, if I'm gonna be able to come to church, then there's this laundry list of things I gotta clean up first. The promise to believers is that you come to Christ first. If you think you've gotta modify your behavior first, then you really don't understand who Christ is and you certainly don't understand who you are. 
Because as we look at the gospel, what you'll find is that if you're relying on yourself to clean yourself up first, you will never get there. The call to everyone is come to Jesus first. Come to him with your brokenness. Come to him with your sin. And he'll transform you. The promise of the cross is that your sin has been taken care of. And the promise of the Holy Spirit is you will not be left unchanged. Because in the kingdom, as Paul said, there's not all this identity. There's not all of this Jew or Greek. There's not slave or free. What, what Paul says is in the kingdom, there are only justified people. And the common denominator amongst all those people is that they did nothing to clean themselves up first. It is a total reliance on Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit as he works this out in our lives now. Don't buy the lie that to come to Christ, you better get your house in order first. Let's get practical for a moment. It's always dangerous when I go off script here, but here we go. Don't buy the lie that your internet history has to be cleaned up before you come to Christ. Don't buy the lie that your gossip obsession has to be squashed before you come to Christ. Don't buy the lie that the arguments that seem to be prevalent in your marriage has to be resolved before you come to Christ. Don't buy the lie that your greed, that your obsession with the things of this earth has to be taken care of before you come to Christ. The, the call for all is to come to him first and he'll give you a new heart. We don't clean up our desires first. He gives us new desires after. So the call is to simply come to him. So these are the markers of a redeemed people as Paul's gonna lay out. Therefore, as God's chosen people in verse 12, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion with kindness, with humility, with gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. What you find in all of those people is that those markers did not naturally live in them. That these are the marks of a redeemed people, of a restored people, of people that the Holy Spirit is sanctifying. They weren't naturally filled with compassion and, and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. They didn't naturally seek to forgive one another, but this is the result of Christ living in them, redeeming them, and continually working amongst them. But the call was come to him first. And so as we look at this idea of stewardship of the mind. What I want you to understand is that it's, it's, not, it's not all on you. In fact, if you're, if you're unredeemed, we're, we're chasing our tail with this. What you'll find is that proper stewardship of the mind only comes when the Holy Spirit is working amongst us. It only comes to those who have been redeemed by Christ. Otherwise, it is behavior modification that does nothing for us in the way of the kingdom. So I guess the question would be this. That have you submitted to him? And as you look at your thoughts, are they the thoughts of a redeemed and justified and sanctified person? Does it mean the flesh doesn't rear its ugly head? I wish I could say that wasn't the case, but I'm living proof it does. But Paul says this, now as a result of what he's working out in you, he says in Philippians 
And the last letter we'll look at, one verse. Philippians 4, verse 8. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. As we end this series, and we looked at all different areas of stewardship in our lives, you may be wondering, like, where do we go from here? I think we have to come back to the fact that everything you need to steward this life well, both the physical things of this life and things like the mind, things like relationships, everything that you need has been given to you by Christ. You can do this because he can do this through you. So as you look at the idea of stewarding relationships, if you look at the idea of stewarding your possessions, stewarding your gifts and abilities, stewarding your thoughts, you need to understand you are walking into the unknown. You are walking <clears throat> into the uncomfortable. But you are walking with the one who is overall. You're walking with the one who has defeated death. The stewardship of your life is nothing for him if you'll surrender it to him. So what I hope this does for us is that it makes us a generous people. With our relationships, with our time, with our money and possessions, with our gifts and abilities and and, and overarching with our thoughts. It's my desire that we would be a church that is marked by being generous with all of that out of the overflow of the generosity that you and I have received from Jesus Christ. If sin no longer stands in the way, if he's given you the power to be free from that, if he's freed you from the penalty of that, then why shouldn't we be obedient and generous with the things that he's given us? We can do this because of the spirit that lives in us. Father, would you make us this people? As we, as we look at your word, we see what you've done for us. I pray that we would be a people who are marked by our generosity, not in one area of our lives, but, but in everything. God, that we would recognize that we have to come to the end of ourself. That your grace is on display and that, Lord, you've you've not required us to clean ourselves up to come to you, but you've promised us you'll clean us up after. God, that the life that we were made for the life with more joy, the life with more adventure, the life with more blessing. It's the life to come. And so, Father, in light of that, I pray that we would be a people who steward this life well. That you would use us to build the kingdom up. That you would give us boldness and courage to to share the bad news of sin and the great news of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that we would point all to an eternity that awaits. So Father, all of this is possible because of you. It is your name that is the name above every other name. It is you who will be victorious over every enemy. So may we surrender our lives to you in every area because it's what you deserve and are worthy of. Lord, it's in your holy and precious name that we pray these things.
until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so. again, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. I pray that the worship was uplifting. It was encouraging. I pray that the teaching encouraged you to dive deeper into your relationship with Jesus Christ. If these resources are a blessing to you, would you consider partnering with Red Brush in giving towards the goal of furthering our ministry? You can do that by visiting our website at redbrushcc.org and click the give tab in the corner. We seek to make Jesus Christ known and your giving helps us do it exactly that.